And now I am so pleased to introduce someone who has much to share with us about civic power and how metro regions can move the needle on big issues. This morning's keynote speaker, Sevan Pavetsian, leads Civic Action, a nonprofit organization in Greater Toronto that coordinates collaborative solutions to that region's challenges. We met Sevan when she spoke to more than 100 Atlanta regional leaders during last spring's Link Trip. In the 13 years since it was founded, Civic Action has helped Greater Toronto achieve some remarkable results. Many of us found Savan's talk during our trip both intriguing and inspiring, and I'm thrilled to present her to you this morning. Please help me welcome Savan Palvetsian. Atlanta region, you give me goosebumps. Wow, table seven, I'm gonna get your card. Thank you so much for welcoming me here. It is my first trip down to the south, down to the Atlanta region, and I'm gonna go back to Canada and tell everybody that it's true what they say about Southern hospitality. I wanna thank Doug and everyone at the ARC for inviting me down. And I've had the opportunity in the last 24 hours to see the power and the energy of this city and this region in action. I had the opportunity to, to go to the Coca-Cola uh, experience yesterday morning and to the, the Center for Civil Rights and Human Rights. That was incredibly powerful. But then I had lunch at the Ponce Market and got a chance to see the Beltline. I've never seen anything quite like that. So while my job back in Toronto, Canada, is to find new ways to unleash the ingredients that we have, I gotta tell you, the ingredients that you have here are world class and, and in many ways second to none. So I'm so excited that I get to spend a couple of minutes sharing with you our journey of collective strength because I think your own journey here is gonna chart entirely new ground that's gonna take you to an exciting future. So I'm gonna talk about three things with you this morning. The first is the rise of the city region. The second is the great leadership shift of the 21st century. And the third is the civic action model. What we're doing in our city region of the greater Toronto and Hamilton area and how you might learn from what we've managed to, to uh, learn over those 13 years, how you might take those lessons and apply some of them in some of the collective strength and impact you're doing right here. So let's start, let's start with the rise of the city region. I am willing to bet that in as few as 20 years ago, the conversations taking place this morning in this room would not have been taking place. Because if you were to hold down the rewind button of history and go all the way back, and this is the same in my country of Canada, the constituting frameworks that created our countries really have no mention of cities or certainly city region. When we think about the pace of urban growth, and you heard Doug talk about some of those numbers that have already happened and that are happening today, in the last hundred years alone, we have turned history inside out. 80% of Americans live in metropolitan areas. In my own home province of Ontario, 86 of us live in urban centers. But how we're organized, how we're funded, how we come together, and the organizations of government haven't necessarily kept pace with the front lines of city life because quality of life is so much more often dictated now by our postal code than it is almost anything else in our world. And so, as time has been ticking along, the world has fundamentally been changing. Let's talk numbers. Over six and a half million people in my region, the greater Toronto and Hamilton area, call that home. Now, there's only 34 million people in Canada, so it represents a huge chunk of our people and our population, and it's literally growing by 150,000 people more every year. 
I know here in the metro Atlanta area, you too are seeing incredible growth. Some of the videos demonstrated the lived experience of that growth. It's taking place everywhere, guys, around every corner of the globe, and it's not going backward. It's only going to get faster, and it's going forward. Let's also talk about sectors. You know, after the Second World War, you could almost count on one hand the number of nonprofits that existed in my hometown of Toronto. The nonprofit sector now powers in your country and in mine about 8% of the GDP, 11 to 12% of all economically active people work in a sector that almost didn't exist 50 so years ago. So we got some new ingredients that we get to play with and mix around with. That too is an exciting new player at a table. And let's talk about the new diverse voices at tables. We've got the Millennial Advisory Group as a great living example of the next generation of youth leaders. But let's talk about the other sense of diversity as well. In my, in my town of Toronto, 50% of the people that call at home were born in another country. And I know here in Metro Atlanta as well, 20% well, of the new residents since 2000 are foreign born. So when we think about how we build our cities and when we think about how we want to engage the wisdom of crowds, we really need to take the lid off what diverse voices mean and really need to be deliberate about finding ways to plug them in. When you see that much growth of numbers, of new voices, of new sectors, it's not surprising that new challenges pop up and out of them. The increases in density are putting pressures on infrastructure that is hundreds, in some cases, of years old. In Toronto today, if you want to buy a house and that house is detached, you're looking at a price tag of a million dollars plus. To buy into the market, over the next 10 years in my city, your household income needs to be $147,000. 42% of Torontonians now live in apartments. And the average size of a condo being built, downtown Toronto, and some of the folks who were on the link trip would have seen this, we have cranes all over my town. And the average size of that condo, 689 square feet, down by 200 square feet from only five years ago. Space is getting tighter. And the infrastructure above the ground with transportation and below the ground with all of those services that pump our life is getting harder to keep up with. McKinsey estimates that globally, the gap of funding that infrastructure is $57 trillion. $57 trillion in global infrastructure that needs to be invested in the next 15 years. That's staggering, staggering. And the governments alone don't have the money for it. Think back to that earlier slide where I described the constituting framework and the way that we get this money that's supposed to fund the lifestyle. That lifestyle has changed. More people are living in it. And so we need to look at creative ways to support the quality of life that all of us are reaching for. In my town, municipalities now are responsible for 60% of public assets. But we only get eight cents of every tax dollar that goes in. Now, you don't need an MBA to do that math. And you can see that history has not kept pace with where the responsibility and the accountability has landed. So this rise of new urban challenges, combined with new residents and sectors, has shifted something else quite fundamentally, and that is who and what we need in our leaders. Now this image may look familiar to some of you. Some of the parents in the crowd, I'm sure this morning, may see this. I have two beautiful young daughters, and they can't get enough of these Where's Waldo books. Now if it's not familiar to you, here's the concept. Someone has written on these pages uh, hundreds and hundreds of people and, and characters, and the job of a little person is to grab your, part, your pen and marker and to find Waldo. So there he is. He's got a striped shirt and a striped hat. And you know what? The way we have looked for our leaders in the past has not been that far off the Where's Waldo book. 
how we've traditionally defined leadership has not shifted until very recently for many, many years. The term first appeared in the 1300s, came from the word laden, meaning to travel to show the way. And now a lot has changed since the 1300s. We no longer take animals to court, as they did in parts of Europe at this time. But interestingly, for almost 700 years, how we define our leaders still very much about standing up out front and showing the way. Those who make our history books, they traditionally share a set of traits and values. A leader was someone who stood at the front of the room, the class valedictorian, the kid who put her, her hand up first. Someone who had qualities like vigor, self-confidence, risk-taking. These are what we valued in our leaders for centuries. Interestingly, collaboration, not one of those words that appeared in many of those history books. But we're in the early stages of a new leadership era, where leadership is less about follow me and much more about work with me. Collaboration is the new civic currency, folks. And here's some proof of this north of the border from my, from my world. In the last 16 months, we've had three elections. So we've had an election with our mayor, we've had an election with our premier, and, we, and as of last Monday, we have a new prime minister as well. Now this slide, if you can see it behind me there as it pops up, is a list of the media endorsements from each of those orders of government and what they said about the candidates that they chose to endorse. See the language they're using there? This is new. Working together. Working with other orders of government effectively. Constructive approach. These new words recognize that new civic currency of collaboration. And it's more than just a pattern that media companies put on their endorsements. The voters saw it too, folks. Every successful candidate the mayor, our premier, our new prime minister, are the ones most widely recognized as being collaborative experts. So collaboration as a prerequisite for leadership may be a departure from the historical script, but it's a no-brainer to the millennial generation. This is a generation that's projected to make up about 50% of the workforce by 2020. And growing up digital, information has never had a boundary. With the swipe of a fingerprint, you could be connected to anybody and any bit of information that's ever been created. Does that sound like a generation that doesn't get collaboration? It's well-informed, it's connected, and it's a generation that I am so thrilled to see have a healthy impatience for action action. We have it in our name and it's everything that we do at Civic Action. And let me share a little bit about how we've seen some of that collaborative action at play. As Doug said, about 13 years ago, a group of civic leaders that would sit at half of one of the tables in this room today, they looked around and they looked and they saw what a newly amalgamated city of Toronto really needed. And there were lots of oars pointed in lots of different directions and our city needed some focused attention. But rather than expect government to figure that out alone, they brought together a group of 40 leaders representing all walks of life, brought them together, and did an honest-to-goodness, roll-up-your-sleeves understanding of what our city needed to go forward. One of those important ingredients is a neutral sandbox. At Civic Action, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We are the safe place that you can come and have any conversation of urban importance because you line the table with the most incredible leaders you can find from all sectors and all walks of life, but nobody sits at the head of it. There's no baggage, there's no sectoral obligation. We just get to focus on what's important. And that's in helping to move our city and our region forward with the kind of urban issues that we know we need to collectively tackle together. Now here's our model. First, we research the need. Data is our seatbelt. 
Every four years, we have a summit. We reload our dance card on what those major issues of urban importance are, and then we get on with trying to tackle them. We put a fence around a discrete action that we want to launch, and then we bring in the cavalry. We reinforce that action with the wisdom of crowds and leaders like folks in the room today. I know you've done some extraordinary work on water conservation. Unbelievable. And we've done some neat things around energy reduction in something called the Race to Reduce. In fact, 42% of all commercial office buildings in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area are competing in the Race to Reduce. And we've encouraged landlords and tenants to come together to, to compete and try to reduce their energy over four years by 10%. Well, next Thursday, we cross the finish line. That's the end of our four-year race. And I can't tell you the results, but you can see a smile on my face. And it's been an extraordinary series of efforts, and 63% of the respondents tell us they would not have done this if it weren't for the race to reduce. Transportation. Yes, it's the number one issue down here. It's the number one issue up there. It's an 82-minute commute for most Torontonians to get to and from life. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. And in my life, we have not seen major infrastructure developments until less than a year ago. And our provincial government finally announced, finally announced, $15 billion worth of transportation infrastructure to serve our region. Now, what was Civic Action's job? Because we're not government. We can't write the check. Our job was to collectively harness a series of voices to marshal effort and energy to say, enough. We need dedicated funding. Do not take that transportation money and put it somewhere else where other needs grow. We need it to be regionally spent. Don't just put it in a couple people's backyard because 2.2 million of us move through different ward boundaries every day. It needs to be fair. It needs to be sustainable. So we had a campaign that we were thrilled to see helped with many other voices achieve historic investments in this much needed area of our city and region. Youth unemployment. There's a third one we've been working on. There are 83,000 young people in our region, between 15 and 24, who aren't in education, employment, or training. Not plugging even one of those young people in costs society over their lifetime a million dollars each. Do the math. Let's find a way to plug these young people in. And let's do it through the private sector. We have had, in the year that we've launched Escalator, unprecedented results in engaging the private sector in what was otherwise considered a community-serving organization's issue or government's problem to deal with. Wisdom of crowds, collective strength, bringing the best of every sector together to work on a topic that hits all of us. Now, you notice in those pictures of those slides a whole bunch of voices around each of those tables. Because we don't believe that city building has a kid's table. We believe that the wisdom of voices includes senior and rising leaders. But we don't expect that rising leaders can get there on their own. We want to put the gas pedal down and fast forward their trajectory. So we started six years ago some leadership development work. You're looking at some faces of our, what I like to think of as our civic Navy SEALs. These are our diverse city fellows. We pick 25 a year. We pack them with 100 hours of extraordinary lessons, competencies, skills, media training, how to work with government. We patch them with a mentor, and not a Fisher Price, my first mentor. These are the Fortune 500 CEOs. These are former mayors. These are people you would want to write home about. And we give these Navy SEALs a civic MBA. And then they go into the universe, and they use those credentials to do amazing things because they are collaborative leaders from the outset. And what they've already gone on to do, well, it would make your hair curl. And while we do this with our 25 civic diversity fellows every year, we have a broader network of 1,000. 1,000 emerging leaders who self-select, who come to our events once a month, who want to learn, who want to get plugged in, who live in a city. They want to build their, their city. They want to be shapeshifters in their city. And our job is to give them the conditions they need to be successful. It's not to tell them what their actions should be. It's not to tell them what their role can't be. It's to give them the conditions they need and let them be. We've had 13 years. And I'm so privileged to have been the CEO for the past two. Here are some of the lessons that we've learned 
that I share with you this morning. The best places to live, they don't have sidelines. You have a way to get in and you have a way to contribute from the outset. Never underestimate the impact of a neutral sandbox, especially during our last administration. There were moments where City Council needed a PG-13 rating. So there are times where you need to take the conversation out of the traditional institutions of power and put them somewhere safe and neutral where discussion can happen, real discussion. You have to change the process to alter the outcome. Water isn't going to come from a stone. You've got some P3 examples right here. The Atlanta Beltline brought me to tears. Your ability to find new creative gray space to build the city and the region you aspire to includes looking at models and flushing some of the old ones right down the toilet. Data is your seatbelt. You have to have empirically rich data and research before you dive in. In part, it helps neutralize the naysayers. So make the discussion less about the empirical evidence and more about the action you're going to take. And your collective strength can lead to civic action. I thank you so much for inviting me to be down here and with you this morning. I commend you for using your voices and vantage points to create the city and the region you want. I thank you for making other people's backyards part of your own. And above all, I wish you action over apathy every single time. Thank you.